After extensive tests at Brandenburg Prison, Hitler, on the advice of SS doctor Werner Heyd, recommends the lethal use of carbon monoxide. An office is opened in Berlin for the program. Its address, Tiergartenstrasse 4, provides the organization's code name, T4. A system using questionnaires and doctors' reports takes form. The forms are distributed to hospitals and asylums. For each patient, details regarding pathology, work capacity, race, religion, and criminal record must be filled in. A space is reserved for the physician's decision. A blue minus sign means life. A red plus sign, death. From the beginning, Jews have a special status. For them, the diagnosis that they are Jews is enough. Later, the screened out patients are fetched. SS personnel in white coats attend to their transport. The bus windows are painted over to prevent people from seeing in. After a temporary layover, the patients are transported to the death facility. During this time, their families receive three letters. The first one states that the patient has been moved on account of the war. Then a second letter confirms that the patient has arrived safely. A doctor has signed it with a faked signature. The last letter prepared by a special department is a letter of condolence stating a fictitious cause of death. The signature on it is faked. At the death facility, the patients are gassed in small groups. The corpses are burnt in the facility's crematorium. In the T4 program, the Nazis' medical vision had found its vehicle of practice. That the T4 doctors falsified signatures and behaved like criminals does not mean that they doubted their own convictions. No, they worried that the German people might not be ready to understand their actions. The killings could have been done by any butcher. But if medical legitimacy was to be maintained, a doctor would have to open the gas taps. As great as the energy expended now in rooting out unworthy lives is the energy devoted to the preservation of valuable Aryan blood. German medical care was among the finest in the world with ultra-modern methods of treatment in many areas. This double role the physician healing with one hand and killing with the other, gradually began to sow misgivings among the German people. Angesichts der unmittelbar bevorstehenden feindlichen Kriegsausweitung auf belgisches und holländisches Gebiet und der damit verbundenen Bedrohung des Ruhrgebietes ist das deutsche Westheer am 10. Mai bei Morgengrauen zum Angriff über die deutsche Westgrenze auf breitester Front angetreten. With the assaults on Holland and Belgium, the Western offensive begins. In mid-June of 1940, Hitler is at his military zenith. France is vanquished. In the gray dawn of June 23rd, a plane lands at Le Bourget outside Paris. Hitler fancies an art tour and arrives with a group of artists to inspect the fallen Paris. It's six in the morning. 
For the first time in his life, Hitler visits the French capital. At his side, the Führer has sculptor Arno Becker and architect Albert Speer and Hermann Giesler. Their first goal is the Paris Opera. As an expert on opera houses, Hitler takes the lead. In all of Europe, there is hardly a theater of renown whose plans he has not studied, and he has carefully poured over the blueprints of the L'Opera in Paris. So well does he know the building that he finds an antechamber missing. In fact, the room had been eliminated during a renovation. Their program proceeds at a breakneck pace. The tour winds through a Paris that is not yet awake. It has been my life's dream to see Paris, Hitler says as he returns to the airport after three hours. Isn't Paris beautiful, he asks Speer, and adds, I have often deliberated whether I should have to destroy Paris, but when we're ready with Berlin, Paris will be but a shadow, so why destroy it? Now it was up to Speer to outdo Paris. The blueprints for the future capital of the world empire were now completed. In a gallery adjacent to the chancellery, Hitler has the gigantic model erected. Here is Hitler's own triumphal arch, twice as big as the one in Paris. Speer has drawn it from a sketch Hitler made in 1925. Here, the Führer's palace, a monstrous complex which will be Hitler's new residence. Here, too, is the Great Hall, the crown of the new Berlin. It is also based on one of Hitler's 1925 sketches. Now Speer would bring the dream to life. This dome was to be the largest assembly hall in the world, with seats for 180,000 people. Its dimensions were incomparable, 17 times as big as St. Peter's in Rome. For the entrance hall, Hitler suggests a colossal statue of himself. An opening in the roof will allow heaven's light to enter. In 1950, at the latest, with the war won, the new capital will be ready. The Great German Art Exhibit of 1940. In den Seelen des Hauses der deutschen Kunst zeigen diesmal 751 Künstler 1397 Werke der Malerei und Plastik.
Hitler buys 202 canvases and sculptures. In the cultural metropolis of the future Linz, construction is underway. The half-completed Nibelungen Bridge augurs the city's new image. Now and then, Hitler pays an unexpected visit to his home city. The war has opened new possibilities for the Linz project. German occupation has unlocked the doors to Europe's treasures. Hitler's men scour occupied Europe, lugging home purchased and confiscated works to Germany. Leonardo da Vinci, Rembrandt, Jacob Jordan, from prepared catalogs, Hitler chooses works of art for transport to Germany. 